In this second part, we're gonna look at things more qualitatively. We're gonna look at, the, again, the process of making a solution and what kinds of factors affect solubility, which at the same time allows us to make predictions about whether substances will be able to make a solution or not. So once more, let's go back to our PowerPoint here. And let's continue in there. Okay. So we're gonna talk about solubility. When we say solubility, what we're referring to is technically the amount of solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solvent at a given temperature. So, you know, although we sometimes say soluble, insoluble in a qualitative general term, technically it is a quantitative description. Some important terms. Uh, when we say that something is soluble or insoluble, many times uh, we are referring to a solution that we're trying to make between a solid solute and a liquid solvent. It's not exclusive. This is not like a rule. It's just I'm saying that more like general usage of the words is many times applied to this kind of solution. When we talk about, let's say, liquids being dissolved in other liquids, we sometimes use the words miscible and immiscible instead of soluble and insoluble. So just a little more vocabulary for you. Again, don't forget that for anything below the threshold of saturation, an unsaturated solution can be dilute or it can be concentrated once more. Those can be relative terms or we can quantify them by using some of the units of concentration we discussed last time. <clears throat> so let's consider how a substance might be soluble in a given solvent. There are three major factors that affect solubility. The structures of substances, the temperature, and in the case of gases, also the pressure. These are the three major factors that we're gonna discuss. We'll start with structure. We'll talk a little bit about temperature and that'll be a nice transition to talk about pressure. And if we have time at the end, I'd like to give you a few extra things here to talk about. Here is a phrase that is a good rule of thumb. Like dissolves like. It's kind of like a good way of predicting solubility. The idea is that substances with similar intermolecular forces are more likely to form solutions. Substances with different types of intermolecular forces do not. Again, going back to our model where we're trying to break up interactions that were happening between solvent particles and between solute particles, in order to get a new set of interactions between solvent and solute, the idea is that when the kinds of forces that the solute and solvent could make are similar to the ones that the solvent had amongst its own molecules or the solute had amongst its own particles, it makes it more likely that those two substances will form a solution. Now, for practical purposes, most of the time, what we're talking about is molecular solutes and molecular solvents. And the question that we ask typically is, are they polar or are they nonpolar? So let's look at this structure here and see how this rule allows us to predict solubility. This is vitamin A, one of the components of a good, you know, healthy uh, organism. Uh, I have the structure in there in the bottom that would be kind of like the Lewis structure, although we've condensed a few of them. Like for example, some of the outside carbons, we have drawn them with their little entourages of hydrogen as opposed to just spreading out every single covalent bond in the molecule. And then on the top, you have a space filling model. Remember that carbon-carbon uh, and carbon-hydrogen bonds are for all practical purposes nonpolar. So the thing here is that this substance has one end of the molecule, has a little 
oxygen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen there, which makes that little piece there polar and capable of hydrogen bonding. However, the majority, the major part of the molecule is actually nonpolar. Most of the molecule is nonpolar. So it is more likely that it will dissolve in nonpolar solvents than in polar solvents, like for example, water. And when it says here fat, just don't take it wrong. Fats are a special kind of molecule. I'll discuss them in a few moments, but uh, our bodies have fatty tissues. And that is typically where things like vitamin A will be more likely to be found is in those fatty tissues that consist of nonpolar molecules. Now, how did I know that the molecule was mostly nonpolar? Well, like I said, you had to visually inspect and identify features in it. This is where your practice and your uh, homework from the previous chapter, a couple of chapters comes into play, right? You, you had to visualize the shape of the molecule, the relative sections in here, the parts that might be polar or nonpolar, and you can isolate how even though there's that little end of the molecule that is polar and capable of hydrogen bonding, the large majority of the molecule is nonpolar. And so it should essentially offset whatever dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding activity you could get about that COH portion there at the end. Okay, let's look at another vitamin, our good friend vitamin C. Once more, I want you to look at the structure of it in there and also add the model. Remember, uh, black spheres are carbons, the red ones are oxygens, and the white ones are hydrogens. And this is where I want you to kind of like train your eyes to identify these special features of the molecule that allow you to determine how polar versus how nonpolar it is. You can see for this molecule, there are a bunch of these OH groups in here. OH there, OH there, OH there, OH there. There's also this whole section here with a carbon and these two oxygens pulling electrons away, totally polar. So although there are carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds in this molecule, you can see the you know, preponderance of these polar sections. And so vitamin C is for the most part very polar. And so it dissolves readily in water, right? And of course, when they sell you the uh, different kinds of supplements, they like to mix it in with some orange flavor and some fizz. So it'll kind of like foam and fizz so make you think that it's very powerful. It's just vitamin C, guys. And uh, most vitamins, the body utilizes in very, very tiny amounts. So, I mean, there is arguments about the health benefits of putting in you know, massive amounts of vitamins and stuff into your body. The reality is that for many people, it just gets excreted out. The body just gets rid of the excess. But anyway, I mentioned fats a little while ago, right? I did mention that. So. Fats belong to a category of compounds where oil also belongs. And of course, we know from experience that oil and water don't mix. As a matter of fact, we know that when there's an oil spill in the ocean, the oil floats on the water. We know that when we make a salad, the vinegar, which is aqueous, and the oil do not mix. So we know that already. Now, why is that? Let's look at the structures of these things. This is a structure of a typical fat. Okay, so in chemistry, fats are a family of compounds. And they consist essentially of these long chains of carbon, carbon, and hydrogen that at one end of it have a carbon-oxygen connection to a molecule that is called glycerol. It's over here on the right side. You can see it there. It's a three-carbon compound, each carbon having one of those OH groups. And they condense with these long chains of compounds called fatty acids, and they form this structure. Again, notice the right side of that molecule has some polar centers, but the vast majority of the molecule 
this whole section here on the left side is completely nonpolar. Not only that, but because of the extended nature of it, what happens with these things is that they can interact via London dispersion forces with other molecules like themselves and essentially stack one on top of another. Because London dispersion forces are strengthened by larger and more extended or distended molecules, you know, these not too weak forces add up and that's why fats are typically solids, although they have relatively low melting points because these are after all weak intermolecular attractions. Now oils are similar, except that in oils, many of those carbon-carbon chains have double bonds in them. And those double bonds, as we saw in the previous uh, lecture where we're talking about the, uh, is that over there? The, uh, creation of those cis and trans kind of isomers that we talked about. Well, these are typically cis isomers around those double uh, bonds of the carbon. And so they generate uh, a kink or a bend in the chain. That means that unlike the previous that we saw with the uh, extended chains in the fat, in the oil, they kind of like flop around a little bit. And so although they can interact with other molecules via lung dispersion forces, they cannot stack as strongly as fats can, which is why typically oils are liquids. Another substance that is uh, part of this family of what we call hydrophobic or just non-water soluble compounds are waxes. You see there in the bottom, the typical structure of a wax. Notice that it's very similar to what you saw, except that you don't have the triple tail of carbon-carbon uh, chains. What you have is on one side, it looks like the fat or the oil, it has what's called a fatty acid. But on the other side, what it has is an alcohol, a substance that has that OH group. And they are linked in a bond that is called an ester. As you can see, these molecules are majorly nonpolar. And because, again, they're very distended, they can form nonpolar or you know, London dispersion forces and stack one upon another to generate essentially a very tightly closed solid that uh, prevents water from getting through. So that's why waxes are good at, as uh, water repellents. The picture there illustrates one of the tragedies when you have oil spills in the ocean or, or in other you know, large bodies of water. Many waterfowl depend on being able to you know, float or swim on the water where they can get their uh, fish, you know, food from. But the reason they do that is because their feathers are covered with some of these waxes. Now what happens is when you have an oil spill, because the oil is nonpolar, it dissolves the wax on the surface feathers of these waterfowl, and so they can essentially drown. So that is one of the tragedies of oil spills in large bodies of water. Okay, so uh, the skill that I want you to develop is this idea of visually inspecting a molecule's structure, and from the structure determine uh, how polar or how nonpolar it is, and therefore what type of solvent it would be more likely to be able to dissolve in. That's the skill, all right? Okay, the second factor that affects solubility is temperature. Temperature affects the water solubility of most substances. And as a matter of fact, most solids are more soluble in water at higher temperatures. As a matter of fact, many of those compounds that we studied earlier in the semester that form precipitates in water, if you try them at higher temperatures, they actually dissolve. For example, uh, lead to chloride, which is one of the compounds that is not soluble in water at room temperature. If you bring the water to near boiling temperature, the lead to chloride will actually dissolve. Now, it's interesting because gases, on the other hand, tend to be less soluble as you increase the temperature. We're gonna see that a little bit later. Let's look at 
another type of graph. Now, in the previous unit, we talked about vapor pressure curves. We talked about the uh, phase diagrams. We talked about heating curves, right? Here, we're going to talk about solubility curves. And what you do here is you measure how many grams of solute will be uh, dissolved in 100 grams of water at different temperatures. In other words, what these lines represent is it represents the saturation amount of that solution at any given temperature. You can see that for most of them, you can see the increase as the temperature increases, so does the solubility. Sodium chloride, interestingly, it's pretty much even, doesn't change much. And there are a few exceptions. For example, you can see where uh, sodium sulfate over here, I'm sorry. You can see where sodium sulfate, for example, uh, has the reverse trend. In other words, it tends to decrease in solubility as the temperature increases, all right? So this is solubility curve. And like I said, each, each point on that line represents the saturation level of that compound at that temperature. So for example, we would say that, let's say at 10 degrees KCl, you can dissolve about 30 grams of KCl per 100 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius. But as you can see at 80 degrees, you can dissolve close to 50 grams of KCl per 100 grams of water. Now this lends itself to an interesting technique, which is called fractional crystallization. It's a separation of a mixture of substances into pure components on the basis of their differing solubilities. So I brought back a little bit of that previous solubility curve, brought it in here, but did it only for potassium nitrate and for sodium chloride, all right? These are the two curves for these two substances. And this is how fractional crystallization works. Suppose you have 90 grams of KNO3, but it's contaminated with about 10 grams of NaCl, which by the way is a very common occurrence. You know, NaCl tends to get into a lot of stuff. What you'd like to do is you'd like to purify the potassium nitrate. You'd like to get a sample that is pure potassium nitrate with no contamination. Let's look at that curve and see if we can find a convenient method for this. Let's say that we take the samples in about 100 milliliters of water, which is roughly about 100 grams of water, at 60 degrees. Notice that at 60 degrees, you can dissolve up to 112 grams of KNO3 and up to about 38 grams of NaCl. So in other words, the 90 grams of KNO3 and the 10 grams of NaCl that we have in here should very easily dissolve. So we have a perfect solution. It's not even saturated for either one of the two compounds, right? Everybody see that? So that's where we started. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start cooling the solution. We're gonna bring it all the way close to zero degrees Celsius. Notice that at zero degrees Celsius, all right, you can dissolve now less NaCl, but it's still up to about 12.1 grams. And we have 10 in here. So that means that the sodium chloride can stay happily in solution at zero degrees. The, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I had that wrong, sorry. Let me change that around, hold on a second. Change that. Sorry, I was talking about sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, you can dissolve roughly up to about 34.2 grams in uh, water at zero degrees. We only have 10, so that means that it should very easily dissolve. Now, KNO3, on the other hand, sorry about that mistake that I made, KNO3 can only dissolve up to about 12.1 grams and we have a total of 90. So that means that there's gonna be a residue of the KNO3 that is not gonna be able to stay in solution. 
So all of the NaCl will stay in solution because you have a solubility of up to 34.2 grams and you have only 10. But of your 90 degrees of KNO3, only 12.1 can stay in solution. So essentially you're gonna have about 78 grams that are going to precipitate. Because KNO3 is an ionic compound, the tendency is that if you do this carefully and slowly, and then at the very end, you pour in just a slight tiny microcrystal of pure KNO3, it'll nucleate this process for the KNO3 to actually crystallize. Remember we talked about last time about the difference between a precipitate, which is kind of like an amorphous, you know, not well-ordered type of solid versus a crystal where the particles are larger and well-ordered. <clears throat> So this is why we call it fractional crystallization. We took advantage of the different solubilities at different temperatures, and now we're able to obtain a pure sample of KNO3. No, it's not a 100% recovery, but we do have 78 grams of pure KNO3. And I bet some of you were wondering, wait a minute, zero degrees Celsius. Wait, wouldn't the water freeze at that point? Wouldn't you have just a solid chunk of ice with salts in it? Ah, well, see, that is the topic of our next lecture next time. And that is when you dissolve things in a solvent, typically the melting point and the, freeze, the freezing point becomes lower. So with these substances in there, it wouldn't be surprising for water to not freeze until it's like, 10 degrees below zero or something like that. And we'll discuss that in our next lecture, all right? Okay, let me give you a chance to finish writing all that. And if anybody has any questions you wanna interrupt and ask me. Okay, now, as we saw here, for the majority of solids, temperature tends to increase the solubility. With gases, it's the reverse. Typically, gases decrease solubility at higher temperatures. If you look at the curve here for oxygen, first of all, you can see that, whereas the previous example had grams per 100 grams of water solubilities, in this case, we are in the thousands of grams. In other words, in the milligrams range. So we're talking that you know these gases are soluble like below 10 milligrams per 100 grams of water. They're not very soluble in the first place. Remember, the, reasons, the reason why these substances are gases is because they have very little, if any, intermolecular forces of attraction. So they're not gonna be very soluble in water, which is a polar solvent. Now notice that as the temperature increases, the solubility decreases. Now remember, Many uh, water species like fish, they rely on oxygen dissolved in the water for their quote unquote breathing, right? They don't have lungs like us. They basically filter the water through their gills and they absorb oxygen directly from the water. Of course, oxygen is not very soluble. And so what happens is, for example, let's say an industry wants to set up shop in a city. Well, the city's environmental protection board uh, are going to inspect what are these industries going to do with their hot water waste. Again, not chemicals, just hot water. Because if they were to dump it into nearby rivers or lakes, the increase in temperature there would decrease the solubility of oxygen, which would then pause, uh, you know, pose a risk to the fish in the area. All right. There's another reason why when I lived in Florida, uh, friends invited me to fish in Lake Okeechobee. It's a very big lake in the middle of Florida. I'm a city slicker. I had never gone out fishing. And what bothered me was like, we had to go out like at 4.30, 5 in the morning. And I'm like, man, aren't the fish sleeping at this hour? Actually, they're not. The reason why you go early in the morning is because early in the morning, the water is cooler. And because of that, the fish can, you know, can be a little higher in the water, you know, less deep, and so you can catch them. 
once the day goes on and the water gets warmer, there's less oxygen in the warmer part of the water, which is the surface. And so they kind of swim a little farther down and they're harder to catch. So that was my experience with fishing. And I don't feel an urge to do that anyway, any, anymore. So anyway, I thought I'd share that story with you guys. <laughs> um, so the solubility of gases is actually affected by pressure, whereas liquids and solids are not. The solubility of a gas in a liquid is actually directly proportional to the pressure of the gas above the liquid. So if you increase the pressure of the gas, it'll, it's kind of like you're pushing the gas into the liquid, making it more soluble. This is actually quantifiable. It's called Henry's Law. The solubility of a gas is directly proportional to its partial pressure. So you see the equation there, S equals K times P, where the KH is called Henry's Law constant. And you can see a table here on the right side with the values of that constant for different gases. As you can see, they're not all the same. Some of them have a higher value of that constant. Some of them have a very small value. So since I give you an equation, this is a little practice problem here. Why not? Let's say that uh, in a given case, the partial pressure of oxygen over water at 25 degrees is 0 0.22 atmospheres. This is the partial pressure. This is not the air pressure, total air pressure. Just the partial pressure, just oxygen. If Henry's law constant for oxygen is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per atmosphere, what is the solubility in moles per liter of oxygen in the water? This is at 25 degrees. Okay, remember Henry's law says that it's constant times the partial pressure. The constant that tell me here is 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3. The partial pressure is 0 0.22 atmospheres. You can see where the atmosphere units are going to cancel out. And so you're left with moles per liter. And the calculation gives us 2.9 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. As you can see, very, very small, not a whole lot at 25 degrees. Now, remember we said the solubility of oxygen will decrease at higher temperatures. So, for example, if at 37 degrees Celsius, which is the average body temperature, the solubility of oxygen is going to be even lower. So how does blood transport it? Well, we don't do it by sheer pressure of oxygen or by sheer physical processes. We use a transport mechanism. We have a shuttle of oxygen. It's called hemoglobin. It's a protein that binds oxygen and transports it and through several different kinds of processes can either take it or release it depending on the conditions of the environment around it. So in the lungs, the blood that flows through there absorbs oxygen, transports it to the tissues, and where it is removed because of the differences in acidity of tissues and the presence, of course, of a system called the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. You'll study that in Chem 1B if you get there. Let me show you another example of the use of uh, partial pressure of a gas to force it to dissolve. Yes, we're talking about soda drinks, or as they call it in the Midwest, pop. You notice that if you have a bottle of Coke or any kind of uh, you know, carbonated drink, typically when you open the cap, yeah, there's bubbling, right? There's like fizzing and stuff, especially if you've allowed it to warm up and you shake it, right? So how does Henry's law explain this? Well, what happened was that when the drink was packaged, they pumped in carbon dioxide under very, very high pressure. That forces a lot of the CO2 to get dissolved in the soda, and then they close it, right? So that means that that bottle is loaded with, well, I'm gonna say loaded relatively, right? It has a lot of carbon dioxide dissolved in the soda. So when you open the cap, you release that pressure. The pressure on the outside is lower 
And so therefore the partial pressure of CO2 right above the drink decreases and therefore solubility decreases and the CO2 bubbles out of solution. Of course, if you shake it, you are physically kind of helping it along. So that's why you can get all kinds of foam. Please don't ask me about the famous Mentos with Diet Pepsi or whatever. I, I kind of gave up on that one a little while ago because it's a little overused. All right, so there's an example of things. Um, what I'd like to do was I want to close up before we leave. I'm going to release you a little early today is talk about another very interesting uh, topic here, and that is soaps. Yes, soap. And I found this article from the past. So basically, our uh, ancestors, uh, let's say the initial colonizers here, they could make soap. Essentially, they made it from um, what's called potash, which is essentially a potassium alkali, like a KOH present in platinum wood. So when they burned wood and stuff, they would take this and then they would use that to make soap by mixing it and heating it with uh, you know, the fat from animals. But here's what's interesting about this article, the bottom paragraph here. Most people who have made soap down through the centuries had no idea what occurred. They just made soap by trial and error, by having lots of luck and believing in many superstitions in how to make soap. Isn't that the history of mankind? So one period in history's experience becomes another period in history's science. Because as we move along, we start discovering how these things work and why they work. Uh, you know, mind you, people have known how to make soap from ancient times, just boiling wood ash with animal fats. And of course, you could put in, you know, fragrances and oils and things like that to make it either more lubricating or make it you know, smell better or whatever. Well, let's see how you make soap from a chemistry point of view. Remember, we said that fats and oils are essentially these compounds that have these long carbon chains attached to a three carbon molecule called glycerol. These chemical bonds here that connect these uh, fatty acids with the glycerol are called ester bonds. Esters are susceptible to sodium hydroxide. And so the sodium hydroxide, which is what you find in the potash or in the ashes or whatever, is what causes these bonds to break and releases the fatty acids on the left and the glycerol here on the right. But notice that the fatty acids are not released as neutral molecules, but as polyatomic ions, uh, of course, neutralized by the sodium ions of NaOH. The actual term for what fats and oils are is triglycerides. And so they become fatty acid salts, which is the soap, and then glycerol, which we call glycerin. It's a very viscous, type of substance. Of course, it has three OH groups capable of a lot of hydrogen bonding, which makes for a you know, fairly viscous substance, right? We call it glycerin. Now, how does the soap actually work? Well, these long chains of carbon with the ionic end on one side form these structures called micelles. A micelle is a you know, molecular structure where all of these nonpolar tails are buried inside the structure. And the ionic head you know, of the salt, this, these things here, there, there, these get exposed towards the water. These are very, very tiny you know, sub-microscopic particles, like you're, like you're going to see them, right? These are molecular structures. Now, what happens is it creates a situation where the interior of this micelle is actually nonpolar or what we call hydrophobic. In other words, it repels water, but it would welcome any kind of substance that is nonpolar, such as oils and fats and other substances that we're trying to remove with the soap. The outside of the micelle is actually what we call hydrophilic. It is, of course, uh, it has electrical charges in it, and so it interacts with the water dipoles. 
So what happens is, therefore, when you put soap in water, all of those substances that water cannot dissolve by itself because water is polar, they get dissolved in the inside of these micelles. At the same time, the outside of the micelle in presenting these charged uh, polar heads, they essentially cause the water molecules to kind of like open up. It changes the surface tension of water. So what I'd like to do is let me take us to a video that I have in here. Let's see if I can find it. And let's enjoy this for a little bit. I'm gonna show you three uh, demonstrations of how soaps can change the surface tension of water. And here we go. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. And that was uh, the end of class. So uh, we have covered concentration. We have covered the thermodynamics of forming a solution and a model for explaining the solubilities and predicting the solubilities of different substances with each other. Our next lecture is gonna be about a specific set of properties of solutions called colligative properties. It'll be very interesting and hope I can also bring up some uh, cool uh, demos for you guys to watch, all right? So uh, we're gonna call it off here and